Hey guys, I have a great uh, special guest today, Jason Fung, who is, uh, you all know, he's very famous on YouTube and he's a, a nephrologist, a kidney specialist. And we're, gonna, we're here to ask, ask a lot of questions and get a lot of great updates. Um, he wrote two bestsellers. One is The Obesity Code and The Complete Guide to Fasting. And he wrote a new one. I think it's called The Diabetes Code, right? Correct. Yes. I'm just digging through that. It's like incredible information. Um, I want to start just by um, talking about some basic things, like what is the cause of obesity? I know you talked about that many times, but... Yeah, and it's a really important question and one that uh, really gets to the heart of how you treat it. So essentially, the cause of obesity is a hormonal issue. And there's different hormones, but the two main ones are insulin and uh, cortisol to a lesser extent. But the main one is insulin. And a lot of uh, people get sort of caught on the minutia. But if, if you look at it from a scientific standpoint, the only thing you need to know is that if insulin is what causes uh, weight gain, then we should be able to give people insulin and make them gain weight. And it turns out that's exactly what happens. So whenever we prescribe insulin, people gain weight. If people have an insulinoma, which is a, uh, a tumor that secretes too much insulin, they gain weight. If you give medications that raise insulin, such as um, sulfonylureas, they gain weight. When you, The other part of the sort of causal um, uh, relationship is that if you take away insulin, they should lose weight. So again, this is exactly what you see. So in type 1 diabetes, for example, where you don't produce any insulin, you lose weight. When people, type 1 diabetics, are taking insulin and they want to lose weight, there's something called diabulimia, where they actually stop taking their insulin and they lose weight. If you take in one of the newer medications called the SGLT2s, they also make insulin go down and you lose weight. So every time you raise insulin, you gain weight. Every time you lower insulin, you gain weight. You can do the same exercise for cortisol, but it tends not to be as important. So again, you can give prednisone and make people gain weight. You can take away prednisone, such as the disease called Addison's disease, and people will lose weight. So you know that there's a causal relationship here. So if insulin is the main problem, then you need to focus on lowering insulin because if insulin makes you gain weight, you need to lower insulin. The problem is that we don't focus on that. We focus on calories instead. And there's an overlap. So the confusion lies in that most foods are a combination of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. So very few foods are pure one thing or the other, except for refined carbohydrates, where you can eat things that are uh, almost pure carbohydrate. But for example, when you eat steak, for it's a combination of fat and protein, most meals which have a combination of all three. So there is an overlap between sort of how many calories you eat and their caloric uh, and their insulin effect. But what it simply means is that not all foods are equally fattening, which is sort of just common sense because the sort of lie that we've been sold is that all calories are equally fattening. So you can eat kale or you can eat cookies and they're the same. So you can eat cookies for dinner and skip your salad and you'll be fine. And any idiot would sort of know that you won't be fine if you eat cookies for dinner. Um, and that's the, real, that's the real thing. So when you look at it from a real scientific standpoint, a lot of what we think about weight gain just doesn't make any sense. That is to say, if calories are so important, why doesn't your body have any sort of mechanism to measure calories? It really has no clue how many calories you're eating. If you're to reduce calories, like for low-fat diets, because dietary fat is sort of the highest in calories, so if you reduce dietary fat, you reduce calories, you should be able to lose weight. Well, guess what? Uh, millions of people have done low-calorie, low-fat diets over the last 50 years. And guess what? The failure rate somewhere on the order of 99%. <laughs> so if we know that a low-fat, low-calorie diet fails 99% of the time, why on earth would we recommend it? It's absolutely ridiculous. It's insane. So, <laughs> it's insane. So that's what the obesity code is really about. It's about 
sort of saying what causes obesity because that's the most important thing you need to know if it's too much insulin then lower insulin how are you going to do that well you can reduce the carbohydrate the refined carbohydrates in your diet you can sort of moderate protein and eat more of the natural fats the other thing you can do is, is intermittent fasting where you don't eat for a period of time because the, the the fastest way to lower insulin is to eat zero which is fasting and there's really nothing intrinsically wrong with that but again uh, we get into this idea where people um, think that oh you need to eat 10 times a day it's like you need to eat 10 times a day to lose weight really how is that going to work how is eating more frequently going to make you lose weight that doesn't even make any sense it sounds really stupid because it is really stupid <laughs> I mean it's honestly like saying you should uh, you know roll in the dirt 10 times a day to get clean it's like, no, you shouldn't yeah. Exactly. If you wanna eat, so every time you eat, insulin goes up. Again, assuming that you eat a mix of um, macronutrients. So every time you eat, insulin goes up, and that's what it's supposed to do. That's a natural um, reaction. Insulin goes up and tells our body to store some of that food energy. When you don't eat, like when you go to sleep at night and when you go to sleep, insulin falls. And that's a signal that you should take some of this food energy that you've stored and pull it back out so you can burn it. So there's a balance there. When you eat, you store food energy. When you don't eat, you burn food energy. Balance the two and you won't gain weight. So if you eat all the time, you're telling your body through insulin to keep storing food energy. And that is not going to make you lose weight. It's going to make you gain weight. And that's, in fact... What exactly what we see. So from 1977 to 2004, for example, we went from people eating three meals a day on average to about six meals a day. The most recent studies looking at people suggest that they eat for um, about 14 to 15 hours of the day. Um, that is, if, and, and it tends to be shifted to later. So if you eat at 8 a.m. breakfast, for example, you don't stop eating until about 10.45 p.m. Mm -hmm. So essentially, the entire day you're eating, as opposed to 1977, where you would eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, that's it. No right. snacks in between, no bedtime snacks, that's it. So you're eating sort of 10 hours and fasting 14 hours instead of sort of the reverse. And this is the, the thing. We're not giving our bodies the time it needs to burn off this food energy that we've stored. And right. there's nothing more complicated than that. So if you want to lose weight, one, don't eat the high insulin foods, and two, give your body a chance to not eat so that your insulin levels can fall and you can burn it. Exactly. So, so we have this uh, mainstream viewpoint that we must lower sugar despite how much insulin we give you. What, from your viewpoint, um, high levels of insulin is even is it possibly more damaging than high levels of sugar in the blood um, i think both are very important so the thing is so now we're talking about diabetes where you have high blood sugar so in type 1 diabetes insulin levels are low so if that's the case then giving insulin is a reasonable thing to do and we know that if you leave blood sugar levels very high uh, remember, this is type 1 where insulin levels are low. So you're not having any problem with insulin because insulin is low, but your glucose levels, blood glucose levels are high. That, that is a problem. So you need to get that down. And that's the sort of um, paradigm of glucotoxicity. That is, if you have high glucose in your blood, it's going to cause damage. What we haven't recognized is that if you have high insulin levels in your blood, it's also very damaging. So in type 2 diabetes, it's a completely different situation where you have high insulin levels and high glucose levels. So both are bad, but if you simply take more insulin to, sh to lower your blood glucose, you're just trading toxicities. That is, you're taking more insulin, so you're, you're having more damage from the insulin, but your glucose is better, so you're having less damage from the glucose. So more insulin toxicity and less glucose toxicity in the end, it's a wash, so you're not actually any healthier. And that's all the studies that we actually proved this exact point 10 years ago. So 10 years, we're still doing the same thing. Even after there was 
the Accord study, the Advanced study, the VADT, the TCOs, like tons of trials that have shown that taking more medications to lower your blood glucose doesn't make you healthier. And that's the whole point. Because if your insulin levels are high anyway, why would you take more? It doesn't make any sense. You should, in fact, lower them. And that would be the proper treatment. Because, again, if you have hyperthyroidism, like if your thyroid is overactive, you don't give people more thyroid medication. Right? right? If it's low, you give thyroid medication. If it's high, you don't do the same thing. So if your insulin levels are low, give insulin. If your insulin levels are high, lower it. But what right. we did was we gave more. Right. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. And, then, and then so there's kind of an omission here. Like traditional medicine does not necessarily jump and test fasting insulin levels, do they? Fasting insulin levels are quite variable, and that's that's one of the problems. So it, it, it fluctuates quite a bit. Mm. And in the late stages of type 2 diabetes, sometimes you see sort of a tapering off of the high insulin levels. They're still high, but not as high as you might expect. Um, it is, I think that what has been unrecognized is the sort of problem of too much insulin. So obesity is a problem of too much insulin, but type 2 diabetes also is a problem of too much insulin. That's sort of unrecognized. So getting a fasting insulin level, I do that regularly to make sure I'm not treating a situation of type where I think it's type 2 diabetes, but it's actually a, a situation of type 1 diabetes where insulin levels are quite low. Um, because again, it's it's you have to know what you're treating because you can't treat them the same. You can't treat low thyroid and high thyroid with the same treatment. It doesn't right. make any sense. It's like saying, you know, a washer and a dryer, like one makes it wet and one makes it dry, right? They're totally different. Right. <laughs> They're the same thing. Exactly. W was there a point in your career where you um, uh, had a, this huge shift of like, wow, we're doing this backwards? What's what, what this like this aha moment when you? Yeah, it's about ten years ago. So those studies came out. So I was trained quite conventionally, and ten years ago, the conventional thinking in type two diabetes. So I'm a kidney specialist. I deal with a lot of kidney disease, the most common cause of which is type two diabetes sort of by far and away. So I see a lot of type 2 diabetes patients. And the classical teaching was that you give as much medication as you need to get that blood glucose down, because the only thing that's important is that blood glucose. Right. And um, so that's what I did. I gave people lots of insulin and got their blood glucose as low as I humanly could. The point was in 2008 when all those trials came out that said that, hey, giving lots of insulin to get the blood glucose down doesn't actually make people healthier. Mm -hmm. And that was when I started thinking, wow, that's a total change of everything that we had been taught, like everything, everything changed. But unfortunately, sort of uh, what happened was that the specialists and the universities, they just kept teaching the same thing. Give as much medication as you need to get the blood glucose down. And I kept thinking, well, isn't that exactly what we proved to be untrue? Um, and it was very strange to watch this. Um, but the problem is that people were so uh, deep into this paradigm of just get the blood glucose down um, that they never stopped to think about what, could, what was the problem. And that was when I really started thinking, well, there's another problem too, and the patients, my patients had recognized that long before I recognized that. So you got to recognize that type 2 diabetes is a reversible disease, okay? So if you lose weight, the diabetes, type 2 diabetes almost always goes away. Um, if you do look at studies of bariatric surgery, for example, where people get their stomachs cut and so on and they lose weight, the diabetes almost always resolves, like in 90% of cases, unless the weight comes back. So we know if they lose weight, the diabetes goes away. When we prescribe insulin to these type 2 diabetics who are older and overweight generally, they tend to gain weight. So it's like, okay, the patients would always say, look, doctor, you always tell me that I need to lose weight. Then you give me insulin and I gain like 40 pounds. Well, how is that making my diabetes better? And I didn't have a good answer because the answer was that it wasn't making them better. The, the point is that 
type 2 diabetes is really a disease of too much sugar in your body. When you take a medication such as insulin, it actually forces that sugar into the body. Remember, insulin is what the hormone that tells your body to store that uh, food energy. So if your sugar is high, you take insulin, your body's going to store it. It's going to turn it into fat. So of course they gain weight. But the question is, what does it do to the sugar? Has it gotten rid of that excess sugar in your body? And the answer is no. It simply forced it into your body where you can't see it because it's not in the blood anymore. But the sugar goes all over your body. It goes into your heart and your liver and your kidneys. And over 10, 15 years, all your organs basically just rot away. That's why diabetics have disease of everything. So if you take a disease such as, say, um, osteomyelitis or gangrene, for example, those are diseases that are seen virtually in no other case other than diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. The question is why? Why do you get this osteomyelitis, infection of the bone, which is very rare elsewhere? Or you get mucormycosis, which are these rare fungal infections. Because you got way too much sugar all over the place, and the bacteria love that. So they're just happy to proliferate, and then you get a bad infection. So the point is that if you take insulin, you're not getting rid of the sugar. You're simply moving it into your body and eventually, if you stop taking the insulin, all that sugar just comes back out in the blood. So you've really done nothing for this disease. And that was the answer to why this sort of current paradigm of sort of diabetes treatment was completely wrong. If, you don't, if people are not losing weight, the diabetes is not going to get better. So that's where I became very interested in the question of what causes weight gain. And it turns out this, it was the same answer. And that's why they're related. They're both diseases of too much insulin. But it's very powerful because once you know that these are diseases of too much insulin, the solution is obvious. Lower insulin. Right. So do that. Low carbohydrate diets, intermittent fasting. Don't lower calories because when you lower calories, you may or may not lower insulin. Like you could take um, Diet Coke, for example, zero calories. Does anybody lose weight drinking Diet Coke? Not really. <laughs> like we've been drinking it for 50 years. It's, a, it's one of the top sort of three uh, soda pops in the world. And clearly there's less calories than a regular Coke, but it doesn't cause less obesity. So we know that it's, it's not the calories. Calories is not the right thing that we should be focusing on. So, so you being a, a kidney spe specialist, you've, you'd probably see a lot of uh, patients coming with stage four on uh, kidney dialysis and advanced stages. What has been your uh, experience with working with some of those guys? Do some of them not need dialysis anymore? Once you get to that stage, it's often too late. And, and I had hoped when I started that, yes, maybe some of them could reverse. You can reverse in the very early stages. So keep in mind that diabetic kidney disease often takes 15 to 20 years to manifest. So if you're coming in uh, at the 18th year, um, very often it will make no difference. So you can reverse it when, when you catch it early. But when you catch it late, it's hard. It's like if you were not to change the oil in your car and then it breaks down, you say, oh, now I'm going to change the oil in my car. It's like, well, great, but it's, it's not going to do anything for your car that's broken down. It's the same idea. Once all that damage is sustained, it's really very difficult to get it to reverse it because you've taken that, that hit already. So you, that's why I'm focused more on getting the message out and getting letting people know that, hey, Type 2 diabetes is not an irreversible disease. It's a reversible disease. It's a dietary disease. Focus on your diet. If you reverse diabetic disease, you're not going to get the diabetic problems that you'll get later on. But if they've developed already, it's very hard to reverse that. It's still worthwhile to work with them because they're at high risk of other problems. But that kidney disease very often doesn't reverse. What about when a patient um, develops... Uh a problem to the point where their potassium starts going higher and higher. Um, and so then they go to the doctor and the doctor says, avoid all potassium foods, including vegetables. And is there, have you found that they pretty much need to avoid the supplement potassium or do they have to avoid also vegetables in general because it's high in potassium? Is that, 
certain yeah. vegetables need to be avoided. So again, this is in the relatively unusual situation where you're talking about advanced kidney disease, and there's sort of nuances in that. Um, the kidneys are not working, they're not getting rid of the potassium. So if you take foods like avocado, which are quite high in potassium, then your body's not going to be able to get rid of it. So you do have to be careful for certain types of foods that are high in potassium, bananas, for example, oranges, mangoes. So there's a number of things that are high in potassium. So, but that is a fairly unusual situation um, in, uh, you know, overall. So it's, it's a, but, but yes, if, if you get to that stage, you do have to be a little bit careful. That's why intermittent fasting works because even if you're worried about high phosphorus, high potassium as advanced kidney disease, because you're actually eating zero, you don't have to worry about that. Your potassium intake is going to be lower than if you're to eat. And again, this is, you know, the, for us, we've, we've sort of pioneered this sort of, um, um, the therapeutic use of fasting. So we have a program called the Intensive Dietary Management Program where we help people with the fasting because it's not fun, it's not easy, right? It, it's, it's healthy, but it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard work. And um, that's what we need people to, to do is get the support they need. And that's what we, we provide in our Intensive Dietary Management Program uh, to people. Uh, but there are certain sort of medical uh, things. If you have advanced disease, you do have to be a little bit careful um, in terms of the fasting. In terms, if you're on medications, you have to be careful and that sort of thing. Yeah, and guys, if, um, I'm going to put a link down below. to He has um, not only books, he has a program on his website. We'll put a link down below. Check it out. Uh, I've, he I've heard great results uh, from what you're doing. And you're in Canada, so you can actually, you don't have to be in Canada. You can be anywhere in the world and sign up to his program and get coaching or um, get the data because you have videos in there. You have all sorts of educational stuff. Yeah, so there's tons of stuff. So there's a ton of free stuff uh, on there. I write a weekly blog and there's links to like YouTube videos and so on. So there's tons of free stuff. And then if you, if, if you need more, then we also have a sort of a membership uh, community where we do like group fast and so on. And then if you want more, you can get sort of a uh, small group um, coaching. So with, with somebody who's sort of experienced with the fasting and can help you because there are problems that do come up. There are things such as headaches and motivation is a big one. So doing things in a group is just a lot easier uh, than doing stuff yourself. And also if you have somebody to talk to, so we have forums that people can communicate uh, with each other. And, and those are the sort of things that make it easy. So it's interesting to me because people always say, oh, I'll never do that. But you got to recognize that many religions have prescribed periods of fasting. So if you look at Catholicism during Lent, for example, if you look at Ramadan and the Muslim uh, faith, if you look at Buddhists, for example, Hindus, Mormons, almost any religion. The reason is a lot easier for them is because they're all doing it as a group. So if you're doing a month of fasting or it's Lent and you're supposed to fast or if you're part of the Greek Orthodox Church, well, all of your friends and family are fasting too. So one, if you have any problems, they can help you. Like, you know, they can make sure you're staying well hydrated and all this sort of stuff. But they're not like cooking a big meal in front of you while you're supposed to be fasting. Everybody's doing it together. So it's just a lot easier. So that's the sort of group support that is actually very, very important in any type of behavioral change. And we know that from groups such as, say, Weight Watchers, which their diet is okay, but the secret sauce, if you will, is the group support. Same as Alcoholics Anonymous. They know very well what you have to do, abstain from alcohol. Not that difficult. But the secret sauce is that group support that they get from each other. And I don't know why we don't provide it for each other, but because fasting is relatively new and people, there's still a lot of myths and misconceptions around the fact that, oh, you have to eat 10 times a day and so on. Um, people don't get the help that they need in order to be successful. And there's other things like, um, you know, people, for example, um, to help with this hunger and so on. So you can use tea, for example, green tea, which has uh, this 
thing called the catechin, which is uh, they have antioxidants, but they have this thing called catechins. And it's been shown that there's a small appetite suppressing effect as well with something as simple as green tea, which you can buy anywhere. Or there's a fasting tea, for example, which is a special uh, cold brewed uh, tea that you can use and it may help with the hunger for example so these sort of things which are simple and relatively inexpensive can help people but you're not going to know about it unless you sort of are, are talking to people about it and because it's so new it's hard for people and that's what we're trying to provide is sort of support for the fasting but there's also free groups like Facebook groups and so on there's there's a there's a ton of information out there if you dig a little bit you're you probably and you know if you put a little work into it you could probably find all the information for free it, it's all out there everything is out there for free these days right yeah yeah especially on YouTube so um, the benefits of fasting go beyond weight loss right yeah so there's a lot of very interesting sort of benefits uh, to fasting and one uh, of the most obvious of course is weight loss and also treatment of type 2 diabetes so we do it a lot to reverse type 2 diabetes and again not very difficult if you don't eat your blood sugars will come down because your body is burning it off if your blood sugars come down you don't need to take your medication so we reverse a lot of people's type 2 diabetes um, but beyond that there's um, other benefits so people find for example, that their uh, concentration improves, uh, they're able to do more because their um, their mental abilities may improve with that. And, and people think, oh, that's strange because I thought it was the opposite. It's like, well, it's not. Think about a time where you ate a huge meal like Thanksgiving. Um, were you really, really mentally sharp or were you just sort of lying in front of the TV watching football? And it's like, well, it's probably the latter. Um, people who, who don't eat actually may have increased mental abilities because you have to understand that when insulin falls, like when you fast, insulin falls, but other hormones go up. These are the so-called counter-regulatory hormones. And two important ones, one is more adrenaline. So it actually increases the amount of energy that goes into your system. So if you look at your metabolic rate, everybody says, well, you're gonna go into starvation mode. That's not what happens because as your noradrenaline goes up, your metabolic rate is maintained. So if you measure the amount of calories somebody is burning at the start of a four-day fast, so after four days of not eating, they're actually burning 10% more calories than, than when they started. And it's because of this counter-regulatory hormone. So you're changing the hormone so that you're actually flooding your body with energy. But the reason is that it, this is a survival mechanism. So if you think back to caveman days, suppose you're a caveman and you don't eat for a few days. If you got weaker and mentally dulled, well, you would really never eat again because it's a spiral, right? You don't eat, you get a little weaker, a little bit you know, less mentally sharp, which means you're less able to get food. And so it's even harder to get food. So you go another day and that's worse and worse and worse. You spiral down and you die. Then we wouldn't be sitting here today. So it's instead of that, and Mother Nature is just not that stupid, right? Instead of that, what it does is our body doesn't shut down. It actually switches fuel sources from food to body fat and pumps us up full of energy. So noradrenaline goes up and growth hormone goes up, which is the other hormone we're going to talk about. And when you do that, you increase your mental abilities and you increase your energy so that you can go out and hunt and get some food to eat. So people have done studies, for example, on um, memory and it increases with fasting and people have done, um, you know, have talked about it. So what was really interesting to me is when I was reading a biography of this uh, prisoner of war in Japan, an American prisoner of war, and they're literally starving, like they have almost nothing to eat. And he describes these incredible mental feats. He says, you know, other prisoners were uh, learn Norwegian in like four days. And uh, hmm. he was reading a book entirely from his mind. And these wow. incredible mental feats. And um, he goes, well, it's just the astonishing mental clarity of starvation. Like, wow. Like they actually wrote that. i like, wow. Wow. Somebody who actually went through severe, severe starvation, because that's what it was in these, in these prisoner of war camps, understood that people got so 
smart doing this. It was just like, oh yeah, I see it every day. Like, you know, this guy's doing this and this guy's wow. doing this. And it's incredible. And this is one of the reasons that the intermittent fasting has taken off in Silicon Valley. It's like the hottest diet trend because like these are not people trying to lose weight. They're these computer geniuses, but they're competing against other computer geniuses. And if you're a little bit smarter, that's the difference between being Facebook and being MySpace, right? You could either be a billionaire or you could be nothing, right? right? So that extra little mental edge is huge. And if you can do it while doing something healthy and doing something free and basically hacking yourself into that extra mental edge, hey, it could mean a lot, right? It's just like performance athletics. That, that last little bit is, 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 is so important. So yeah. that mental ability is, is one of the benefits. The increased energy is one of the benefits. And we hear it all the time. People coming in and they're saying, oh, wow, I have so much energy. Um, a lady we had who, who, who couldn't barely go from the waiting room to my office like we we basically the next time she was like running in it was crazy because she was on all this insulin and remember insulin which goes up when you eat is a storage hormone it tells your body to store the energy so if you're taking a ton of insulin your body is busy storing all this energy and you're not able to use it because it's all going into storage so when we took her off we allowed her insulin to go low, which allowed her body to start releasing these energy stores. Remember, it's not that you're shutting down your body, you're switching your fuel sources from food to body fat. And it's like, that's perfect. That's exactly what we want to happen. And then there's more theoretical benefits. Um, so for example, um, Alzheimer's disease, some people have thought that intermittent fasting may be very beneficial because you, you stimulate this other sort of cellular cleaning process called autophagy. So when you, uh, particularly when you're doing water fast, um, get past a certain sort of 24 to 36 hours, you stimulate a process called autophagy, which is where your body actually breaks down protein. So you break down these subcellular parts, which tend to be the older parts that aren't working so well. And um, everybody thinks, wow, breakdown of protein, that's really bad. It's not really bad because the other hormone that goes up quite a bit is growth hormone. So when you do a sort of a feeding fasting cycle, as you fast, you're going to break down some protein. But as you start to eat again, because growth hormone is way up, you're actually going to rebuild that protein. So it's a whole sort of renewal process. So it's just like renovating your bathroom, for example. The first thing you gotta do is actually throw out that lime green tub from the 70s, right? If you don't take that out, you can't put a new one in. So the first step is to actually break it down, then rebuild it. And that actually keeps you uh, functioning better than if you never broke it down in the first place, which is why a lot of people consider the fasting, which used to be called sort of a cleansing thing, which is what it is. You're cleaning out that old stuff in your body and you're trying to renew it with new stuff, which is like perfect because it's a free process. And it's a process that's been used for thousands of years, not as something which is like, oh, well, I'm going to punish you. It, it was used um, because people knew that it was sort of intrinsically healthy for uh, for staying well and all this sort of thing. So it's a fascinating because science, sort of modern science, is just sort of catching up to this sort of 2,000-year-old idea right. that once in a while we should fast, right? whether it's the Prophet Muhammad with Ramadan or if it's Jesus Christ with Lent and all that. We're just catching up to this idea that, hey, these guys, they didn't know the science, but they knew that when people did this, they actually stayed relatively healthy. Because remember, there's no obesity uh, 2,000 years ago, or there's very little. Um, but it's it's something that's healthy. And hey, now we're, we're realizing, yeah, it can be healthy. And even for things like cancer, well, same thing. Cancer is a disease of um, increased growth. So if you fast, you're going to shut down these growth pathways. So everybody thinks, um, you know, cancer is a genetic disease, but in fact, there's a lot more 
to it than that because the World Health Organization categorizes, I think, 11 or 14 cancers as obesity related, including common ones like breast cancer and uh, colorectal cancer and so on. So if you allow insulin to fall, you're not going to have these growth signals, which is going to possibly prevent a lot of these sort of obesity related cancers from gaining hold. That's theoretical, but makes a lot of sense these days. Absolutely. What what uh, type of fasting do you do uh, personally? I typically stick to sort of a uh, 24-hour fast, and that's because the our sort of number one rule for fasting is to fit it into your lifestyle. So if you do something very intrusive on your lifestyle, you can do it, but not for very long. It, it, it's, it's a therapy, right? It's therapeutic. So I had one time, one fellow who used to fast, and so he used to get together with his friends every so often to, you know, to meet and chat, and he'd stop doing that because it's like, no, 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 that's not the point. The point is to fit it in where you can, but do everything you normally do. Um, because again, having friends is very important. I mean, getting going out and uh, celebrating is very important. So you have to find something that you're going to be able to stick to. So doing something like a three or five day fast is very intrusive because if I don't do it, like I usually have dinner with my family most nights. So I can do that, but it's hard. If you're fasting, everybody's eating, you're not eating, it's hard. Um, so that to me works the best. So a lot of 24 hour fast and once in a while I'll throw in a longer fast. So three days or longer. And that's typically after I go on vacation and on vacation, I typically don't fast because again, I'm with my family most of the time and you know, they want to eat or, and, and we'll go out. I'll still, you know, try and limit stuff. But on the other hand, you don't want to be the party pooper all the time, right? You don't want to say, Oh, you know, I'm the guy who won't do anything won't go out and all this sort of stuff it's not it's there's no balance there so you got to find what works for you um and for some people it's longer fast some people shorter fast but that's the sort of thing i stick to when my pants start to get a little tight then i do more fasting right <laughs> i'm really busy then i do more fasting um when i decide to like during holidays so typically i'll do christmas for example i won't i won't watch what I eat at all and I will probably do very little fasting and also during vacation and I've made that decision but I know that I have to make up for it afterwards so right. you know I just I just went on vacation and I had a lot to eat and it felt great and then I got back and my pants were a little tight and I, I, I upped the fasting so I'll typically do it at least twice a week but the last couple of weeks I've been doing it four to five times a week and now my pants fit better now. So <laughs> did, you, did you find before you uh, started fasting that were you the grazer that snacked between meals and at night? Did you, were you that type of person? Um, not typically, but I think that we had all sort of started becoming that. So if you look at um, meetings and so on, right? So you go to a meeting I don't know if you do a lot of meetings, but like at the hospital or at a, any company and you have a meeting at 10 a.m. and there's muffins and you go for lunch meeting, there's lunch and then you go for an afternoon meeting and there's more muffins or donuts or cookies or something like that. Right? And the problem is that when they're there, it's extremely tempting and that's something that's new. And it's like, that's something that we don't need. Um, we, we, we got fine by fine in the 60s and 70s without sort of muffins and bagels at the 10 a.m. meeting. So why do we need it now? And so we had all sort of become that sort of, oh, we should eat something. And, and, and it's the same. Uh, it's become ingrained in our society and I think it's very unhealthy. So my son um, went to camp this week um, and uh, you know they sent me back an email saying, oh, welcome to camp. Uh, we're going to provide lunch and two snacks. I'm like, why? <laughs> it is but why do all these kids need snacks? I don't know if you have kids, but oh, yeah. you, know, um, you go play soccer, for example. So the kids used to play soccer. And at every halftime, somebody thought it was necessary that the kids have some juice and cookies. I'm like, why? I used to go out and play soccer as did everybody else in the 1970s. And guess what? Nobody ate snacks. 
My parents weren't chasing me around with a juice box and two cookies. I'll tell you that much. You just went out and played and had a great time. You didn't even think twice about whether you wanted to eat because you're too busy playing. Yeah, I mean, your your parent your parents would sit down. All of us would sit down, three meals. But then now it's like everyone's on the run. Grab some quick food. No one eats, sits down. It's like it's completely shifted. The whole uh, lifestyle is shifted to uh, small snacks, bring a snack between meals, after school, the whole thing. Exactly. And, and there's nothing wrong. I mean, we're not going to change the fact that people are going to be on the run all the time. But changing the sort of snacking habit and making sure that you have a proper fast. Because remember, the very word breakfast means you have to fast. It's a meal that breaks your fast. If you're not fasting, you can't break it. So therefore, you should be like 10 or 12 hours. Like you should finish dinner and then not eat anything until breakfast. There's no need for an for a, for a evening snack. There just isn't. Hmm. And you don't need to have that. So even if you are on the run because you're going to this and that and this and that, you can still eat three meals a day and not snack. But there has to be this recognition that, hey, snacking is actually pretty, pretty fattening, um, which is probably what your grandmother would have told you. Now we've gone from, oh, snacking is fattening to snacking is super healthy. That's why we're ordering muffins for our, our meeting. It's like, no, right. we should get rid of that. You can have coffee, but don't, have, don't order the plate of uh, muffins. Don't order the plate of cookies. Don't order anything. Um, you've gone to medical conferences. They're the worst. Even the obesity conferences, you go there, what do you get? You get breakfast at 10.30, you come out, and there's a full spread of banana loaves and muffins and cookies. Then it's like, yeah, because you only ate breakfast like an hour and a half ago, <laughs> and you're right. going to eat lunch in an hour and a half. Like, obviously, you need a muffin in between, right? It's like, come on. Oh, God. And then you have your, your, your lunch, and then, you, and then at 2.30, at the, the afternoon break, Guess what? Another full spread of <laughs> granola bar. Every single medical conference is the same, right? Oh, it's my like, God. Oh, my God. It's, like, terrible. But, again, when it gets – when you see it over and over again, when, when you're exposed to it in your school, you think that it's normal and you think that that's healthy. It's not. It's, it's completely new to this sort of generation. And guess what? They're not better for it. They're much yeah. worse for it. Incredible. Wow. Well, thank you so much for your time and your input. This data was extremely valuable. Uh, people are going to get a lot out of it. And hey, guys, I'm going to put uh, some links down below. Check out his website, his programs, his books. Um, it's extremely valuable. Well, thank you so much, Doc. And uh, uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Eric.